Sam is here too. Okay. Yay! Okay, welcome to Voice Chat. We're discussing part one, the something or other of the Zen Master. Sure, Somebody that's exactly what the title says. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The something or other of the, the Zen Master. The something or other of the Zen Master, you know who. <laughs> you know that one? <laughs> that one Zen Master. <laughs> His name I can definitely pronounce all the time, every time, correctly. Um, so... The reason, without diving directly into the text, the reason I think you're going to have fun with this one, Max, is one, I've heard you talk about similar concepts before, but also um, I had difficulty reading this particular section of the book. It was a combination of some of the concepts. I wouldn't say they were going over my head so much as I just could not absorb them. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's very fair. It wasn't that I didn't understand what they were trying to say so much as I just couldn't take them in. <laughs> yeah. And um, and in that way, it was just, you know, in that way, when Zen, Zen Buddhism is like, let me say five zillion contradictive statements, and then at some point you'll probably become enlightened. Right, if I just smack your brain enough. If I smack you hard enough with all these weird statements, it'll happen. <laughs> Which, that's legit, you know. Yeah. Sure. But anyway, that's how I felt reading through this chapter. It was just like I was hitting my head against a brick wall hoping enlightenment would come. <laughs> the whole thing was just a giant koan. Yeah, I think so. Um, well, that's a ringing endorsement. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not a badly written book. It's it's fine. It's just it really just thick. Like it's really <laughs> thick. It's not it's not a light read and I think we've really I've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years really going through much lighter reads. Um that presents the information much more approachably, I guess. And so to have to actually sit here and like take in the poetry that is a contradictive koan like you know what I mean? It's just, it's a different exercise for my brain. I do understand. I do indeed. Okay, so to start this out, um, the author calls it a collection of sermons and dialogues. So it's just section after section after section of different, like, chunks of info, and a lot of them are repetitive. Sweet chunks, bro. Sweet chunks, bro. Um, so the first one really summarizes itself here in that all of the Buddhas and all sentient beings are nothing but the one mind. And yes. Complete oneness. Complete oneness. Uh, by their ver And then uh, goes on to say that by the very seeking of this oneness, you lose it. For this is using the Buddha to seek for the Buddha and using mind to grasp mind. Which mm. are concepts I get on a internal level but are ones that I have difficulty formulating ways to actually discuss about, if that makes sense. So I read this chapter, and the first run through, all I felt was like, how are we even going to talk about this? This is a lot of not talking going on. <laughs> like, we're going to talk about it without talking about it. And we're going <laughs> to... You, you know what I mean? So like, I, I, I just, I had some interesting difficulty around this text of thinking of how a discussion might play out around it. Um, Hold on, I'm, I'm promoting us. Mm. And misspelling words. Yeah, misspellings. Those are the best. Yeah, we are having fun. We no. are so good at everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> no flaws. All right, what did you just say before I said I was doing the thing? I was talking about how the book made me feel like it was a difficult discussion piece because it's a yeah. lot of thinking, not thinking, and talking, not talking. Oh, yes, okay, the second sentence you've highlighted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not that it's... These aren't... These are good things to meditate on. These are good things, I think, and the practice to, like, reflect on. And I don't know that this is so much the one that we should go through, like paragraph by paragraph like I kind of do sometimes mm -hmm. because um, just of how thick these ideas are and I immediately am jumping to where he begins to talk about conceptual mind 
And mm. um, where does it conceptually? So the author, go, the, the, the speaker, the sermon giver, goes back a lot back and forth with this idea of the conceptual mind and letting go of conception and um, that to let go of these substances in the mind is how you obtain like supreme knowledge. Yep. And so all of these things are good. Really, this is going to be ranting about how do I talk about this? And hopefully in the end, I'll end up talking about this. <laughs> At any point, you could just be like, this sentence, go, and I will go. Yeah, yeah. Um, the first one struck me as a potential rant for you. Um, another, I had another one. Um, here, where it starts with number four, I think that one would be good to talk about more maybe in depth. Um, making offerings to all the Buddhas of the universe is not equal to making offerings in one follower of the way who has eliminated conceptual thought. Why? Because such a one forms no concepts whatsoever. The substance of the absolute is inwardly like wood or stone in that it is motionless and outwardly like the void in that it is without bounds or obstructions. It is neither subjective nor objective, has no specific location, is formless and cannot vanish. Those who hasten towards it dare not enter, fearing a hustle down through the void with nothing to cling to or to stay their fall. So they look to the brink and retreat. This refers to all those who seek such a goal through cognition. Thus, those who seek the goal through cognition are like the fur, the many. Oh, I lost somebody with my epic reading. While those who obtain intuitive knowledge of the way are like the horns, the few. So I think that would be worth talking about. I think that this has the most clarity of thought process for me. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. So I think this section four has the most clarity of thought process. And I would love to hear your take on all of this, Max. Okay, um, so this is speaking in dualistic terms about a non-dual type of thing. Um, the, the earlier statement about seeking, essentially making it impossible to find, is related to this as well, because uh, whenever you take up a position, you immediately enforce its, op its opposing position as well because they have to coexist. Right. And uh, with this, it's saying making offerings to all the Buddhas is not equal to making offerings to one follower of the way who has eliminated conceptual thought. I don't think it's referring to this as the actual Buddhas because those Buddhas have also eliminated conceptual thought. In this, I think it's saying making offerings as an act of uh, devotion or whatever, just like, you know, like with Christians and praying, like you're doing this thing as as uh, a ritual or as a way of trying to feel better about this. Um, but it's not actually going to get you anywhere as long as you continue to stay in your little mind, we will call it. Um and trying to conceive of it rather than grasping it directly through meditation or whatever yeah. will only lead you away from it. Because, as I said earlier, the mind cannot grasp the mind. Mm -hmm. And this is illustrated with, with the sentence, it is neither subjective nor objective, has no specific location, is formless, and cannot vanish. The mind can't understand that intuitively. Because the mind needs something to grab onto and point to and put a label on and say, that's what it is. And this takes away all of the labels you could possibly put on it. Um, the next sentence, those who hasten toward it dare not enter, fearing to hurtle down through the void with nothing to cling to or stay their fall. That is the grasping mind. That is the mind that I was just talking about needs something to point to and define so that it can feel secure in its estimation of what reality actually is. Because this, this enlightenment, um, to quote Adyashanti, is a destructive process. It tears down what you understand reality to be and leaves you in this 
void, without description, without name. And, you know, all of these sutras, all of these practices are aimed towards sparking that insight <clears throat> into this. But they're all done through words. So yeah, that's where the, the Zen um... thing comes in. Oh, gosh. So this immediately ties into what happens in section six, which, sorry, like, you've immediately, like, oh, yeah, this is really cool. Yeah, go for it. Um, of There's, like, the idea coming down to that enlightenment leads you to nothing. <laughs> yeah. Like, the, um, there is no pious practicing, no ac there's no action of realizing it's, it's, it's a, a nothing, almost. Um, and... Then it also, so mostly our thought section six was really interesting to, sorry, I'm going two different thought processes at once. I need to, <laughs> I need to untangle for a second. Um, in section six, what I really enjoyed was it discussing how some people like effectively that each path is a little different. Um, and like some people are going to like, boom, I got it. Oh, I'm in like, boom, this makes sense. I've, 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 I've absorbed it. I've assimilated. I get it. And that's boom. That's a flash of lightning for them. They got it. Other people, they're gonna have to walk down the. Uh, the they're gonna have to do like the ten stages. They're gonna go the gradual the path. They're gonna go through a gradual path. Um, but whether they transcend conceptual thought by a longer or a shorter way, the state of being, there's no pious practicing and no action of realizing. So like at the end result is the same. Mm -hmm. And it admits no degrees. So the latter method merely entails tales aeons of unnecessary this author the the sermon giver i should say because this is a translated text the um sermon giver seems to look down on taking the slow path well it's it's i understand why they're doing that they're looking down at it not in a judgmental way so much as an ineffective way because the point of this is to eliminate suffering and if you're taking a long time to get there you're really not eliminating as much suffering as you could, are you? Right. Like, and and it's been mentioned many times in several texts that uh, even if you have future lives, you have no guarantee that those future lives will be fruitful in these endeavors. So you should really get on your shit right now. Um, and that I think this is an extension of that saying, while you may like, while time may be an illusion, it's still not something to waste. And, uh, yeah, I, I mean, personally, enlightenment is enlightenment, in my opinion, whether you get there slowly or quickly. Um, but I do think it would probably be better if you just did it quickly. Now, uh, as to whether or not people have a say in this, that's yet to be determined. The right, typical it's difficult to say how much you're deciding, like, no, I'm not going to be enlightened. Right. I'm going to wait longer. understanding of Satori and spontaneous enlightenment is that it comes unbidden and uh, it's just kind of like a lucky thing. Just like in Christianity, if you have grace, you didn't earn that. It just came to you. And the same thing with this. But, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen to someone, so they have to do the long way. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to eat this Brussels sprout. <clears throat> I believe I, in you, Des. I was really hungry, so I made a bowl of roasted Brussels sprouts. Sounds good. Uh, Selenium asks, I thought people had to learn enlightenment. Max? Oh, well, you don't necessarily learn enlightenment so much as you learn the practices which can facilitate the recognition of enlightenment. Because, uh... It's more of an, it's more of an unlearning than anything else, um, because you have to let go of your attachments, your quote unquote wrong views, etc. Your conceptual um, mind, if you will. Right. Right. You have to untangle yourself in the true you from all of that. Mm-hmm. Which is its own polishes sometimes. <laughs> I don't know if I efficiently answered that or not. Selenium asks, so more like wisdom? 
There is certainly, yeah, it's a lot more like wisdom than knowledge, for sure. Um, because you, you have to get a good understanding of who you aren't before you'll figure out what's left and who you are. And for most of our lives, we're busy saying who we are and putting terms on ourselves. And this is me, that's me, that's not me. But right. as long as you're telling yourself who you are, you're not going to bother looking, you know? Right. Yes. So the next couple sections, um, and we'll get back to any questions if you guys want to interrupt us or type them or whatever. Feel free to unmute and yell at us if you need to. Um, is really kind of the parts of this practice that I was originally introdu introduced into in my early days, which was this idea of the, I, I like the sentence here, which is all wriggling beings possessed of sentient life and all the Buddhas and Buddha Bodhisattvas are of this one substance and do not differ. <clears throat> And I'm a wriggling being. I know. I loved that sentence. I was like, oh, <laughs> wriggling beings. And I like wiggled a little while I was reading. And I was like, yes. I, I can relate dork. to this. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I'm attached to this. Dang it. Oh, step back. <laughs> it's okay. If you realize attachments, you stop being attached to them. Yeah. Oh, that's a whole other conversation I would love to talk more about sometime of like the, the differentiation between it being attached, recognizing an attachment, and when are you actually attached versus like, I don't know, um, humoring an attachment, if that makes sense. Are there levels of, I realize this is a thing, I'm kind of choosing to continue doing it, am I truly attached or am I not? I don't know. <laughs> Just things like that. I, I think about those sometimes. Um, and then it says, so then it just continues to reinforce this idea that above, below, and around you all is spontaneously existing, for there is nowhere which is outside the Buddha mind. And this idea of oneness and just everything is together, like, and not apart. And these ideas were, like, one of the first things that brought me to this idea of Buddhism and the path. And, um, I don't know. So that vibed well with me. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's bringing up uh, oneness in the concept of interdependent arising. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> here's something for you to comment on, Max. Mm. Um, when people of the world hear it said that Buddhists transmit the doctrine of the mind, they suppose that there's something to be attained or realized apart from mind and thereupon they use mind to seek the dharma not knowing that mind and the object of their search are one mind cannot be used to seek something from mind for then after the passing of millions of eons the day of success will still not have dawned such a method is not to be compared with suddenly eliminating conceptual thought which is the fundamental dharma Okay. Whoa, well, that's a sentence. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> so I would love to hear you uh, reflect and uh, talk about section 10 for your reference. Um, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so this is more mind-seeking mind. This is more trying to think your way out of the trap. Mm -hmm. Um. Think harder, I would be free. <laughs> right. So this this goes back to fundamental ignorance as the root problem. And Excuse me, in sorry. that ignorance, you know, we, we try and be like, oh well I've learned things with my brain and I you know, I can add now, so I can I'm sure I can figure this out. But this is a this is a higher order issue. It's it's a meta problem that is above 
the brain's pay grade in the usual way. <laughs> Above the brain's pay grade. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love that. <laughs> My brain is a horrible employee. <laughs> My brain it, is a terrible employee! Why haven't I fired it yet? <laughs> well, it's a terrible boss, that's for sure. It's an alright employee if, you know, you know what it does. It's worse, it's an employee that thinks it's the boss. Absolutely, that is the, the yeah. problem here. <laughs> that's that's the illusion. Um... Such a method is not to be compared with suddenly eliminating conceptual thought. So this does give me very strong Zen vibes. Um, because they're just cutting cutting through all the bullshit and saying, look, just stop it. All right? Just stop it. And people are like, what do you mean? Um, but that's where the Koans come in. That's where... What do you mean, just stop? <laughs> <laughs> Just stop thinking. Turn your brain off. But, you know, we've been conditioned our whole lives to think. We're, we're humans. We're smart animals. That's, that's what we're... That's our shit, you know? Like, why would I stop thinking? Well, it's so that you can reach something behind the thinking. It's to clear your mind for even just a second. And that's all you need to be able to realize this. Um, and that's, I think what the author was trying to get across is that sure you can spend you know 20 years meditating in a cave if you really want to but you don't have to and all that's doing is preparing you to do the same thing i'm suggesting is uh, just yeah, let cave go meditation yeah <laughs> everybody loves cave meditation everybody everybody um, yeah, so this, yeah, I don't know how much more I have to add on this. How about this sentence? Buddha said, I truly attained nothing from complete unexcelled enlightenment. <laughs> so this is in language is fun. Yeah. Um, attained is an important word to look at here because... You cannot attain something which is already yours, just as, like, uh, if you possess something already, how can you, how can you get it from somewhere else? You've already got it. You right. can't obtain it, you know? And so that is an important part of this. And the nothing? Well, attaining nothing, if you think of it logically is nonsensical how do you add an absence to what you have well in this case it's recognizing that that absence is there and not only that but enlightenment itself is the absence and by absence i mean emptiness you can attain nothing by recognizing your own inner emptiness that's always been there. So you didn't gain it, although you did gain it by recognizing it. Um, and to, to, to put the cherry on top, it, it's nothing. It's not special. It's not like something to be uh, praised or whatever, although that is done, once you reach this state, you recognize, oh, okay. After enlightenment, the mountains were mountains and the rivers were rivers. Yeah. It's nothing. But it's an essential nothing, if that makes sense. Very good. <coughs> Remember, we would love more insight from many participants who would like to give their thoughts on the text. Otherwise, Max and I just go on and on for days. <laughs> it's a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like picking apart Max's point of view and also complaining about my own lack thereof. 
Um, it's okay. You'll form opinions one day. One day I'll have opinions, and then I'll be a real boy. Cell <laughs> <laughs> is writing something. Yeah, I was hoping, I was kind of like, that's why I was babbling a little bit. I was kind of giving them a minute to type out whatever it is they need to type out. Well, Epsilo asked, isn't the world changed from people that work on those ideas that they are attached? I mean, yeah, but the world is always changing. That's yeah. that's impermanence for you. Bonk came in deafened. It's going to be hard to hear. Yeah. Maybe they, do you think they know they're deafened? I'm gonna at them. Bonk. You are deafened. <laughs> All right, let me read this. From day to day, we don't really think about what we do. We just do because our subconscious knows it's gonna take forever for us to reflect before we do. Reflection takes practice to remember to do it and to open our subconscious. Absolutely. This this is the um. This is the default network. In yeah, uh, in 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 brain science words, wow, <laughs> brain science words. You're you're so smart. Brain science words. <laughs> I guess I'm just I'm just dumbing it down. Um, <laughs> for myself, probably. <laughs> so that's that's the whole point of mindfulness practice is. Uh, learning to enter into the active state of aware of, of awareness and observing rather than just going around and you know default autopilot bullshit mode where you just follow through your conditioned patterns and you know you open the closet you, you close the closet you turn the light off oh it was already off well I always turn the light off like that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, our desires are enabled by the subconscious I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Are they enabled by the subconscious, or are is the subconscious influenced by our desires? Well, our desires are certainly influenced by the subconscious, um, and you know that's how we can like come up with weird interests that we personally find fascinating and most other people we know are just like why is this interesting for you why are we talking about this again right <laughs> <clears throat> oh the answer to chicken and egg is egg always egg just for the record chicken egg uh, the chicken is the egg didn't you just read that section six <laughs> um, uh, our desires if you want to look at it from like a metaphysical point of view our desires come from the attempt to be enlightened because once you're enlightened desires arise and desires fall but they don't have the same pull they did before enlightenment and the reason they have so much pull, the reason that the ego is so convinced by them, is that uh, the ego, on some level, recognizes the illusion. It recognizes the, uh, the fundamental problem with its own conception and with its conception of the world. So... Desires seek to try and distract away from this specific kind of dukkha, this recognition that something isn't as it seems. Dukkha. Um, and so desires are very palatable because, I mean, why would I think about my inevitable death if I could just, you know, play a video game instead? That seems better, <laughs> right? <laughs> why, why reflect oh, on this? Oh, you mean how I cope with all of my existential dread? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's what I mean, yeah. Oh, but what if I play video games instead of having existential grid? That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. 
what is the importance of ego and how does it come to exist? Um, ego is important socially. We are, we are taught, you know, this is your name. This is what qualities we see in you. And you decide whether or not you want to pick those up and identify with them, attach to those qualities, or if you want to reject them and attach to those qualities that way. That's the fun thing. Both clinging and aversion are forms of attachment. Um, it comes to exist through conditioning. Mm -hmm. we, we condition ourselves and we are conditioned by others and we are conditioned by the environment. So we collect all of these ideas and habits and likes and dislikes and we form a history of ourselves and all of this and we use that as a placeholder to try and say, this is who I am. It's rare to find someone, you know, outside of like a philosophy class or something that contemplates, well, would I still be me if my memories were gone? Or mm -hmm. if I didn't like the things I liked, what does it mean to be me? Those things don't normally cross through the average person's mind in their day-to-day -day life. And that's why, <laughs> that's why this conception of me through the ego is so difficult to get rid of. It's very persistent. And the thing about conditioning is the longer it goes on, the harder it is to extinguish. So ego is important in that it is a mistaken view, or rather not even mistaken, it is a limited view of who we are. And as long as we only refer to that as who we are, we will miss the vastness, the infinite vastness of who we really are, as, long, as well as who everyone else is and what everything else is. Because it's not just yourself that the ego limits, it's the entirety of reality. Mm -hmm. Because you look at a tree and you say, ah, that is tree. You don't look at the leaves, you don't look at the bark, you don't see the little bugs and stuff on it. You just say, ah, tree, tree generic tree TM. That's what that is. <laughs> and you lose a lot of the complexity. Generic tree TM. <laughs> tree. <sighs> Sorry. The bugs are the fun parts. <laughs> the bugs are the fun parts. It's true. Um, <clears throat> so... Men are afraid to forget their minds, fearing to fall through the void with nothing to stay their fall. They do not know that the void is not really void, but the realm of the real Dharma. Oh, yes. This this brings to mind um, the analogy of getting pushed off a cliff. And, mm -hmm. you know, well, it's more like you're on a ledge and the ground beneath you crumbles and you start to fall and the ground falls with you. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you scramble around, you try to grab the rocks that are falling next to you. This is the, form, the, the version of attachment. And hoping that, well, if I hold on to this, maybe that'll help. And you realize, how would this help me? It's just falling with me. There's no, this won't help me at all. And so you freak out. This is, this is approaching enlightenment. This is when you are endeavoring in these practices. You recognize that you're falling now. Um, and... With uh, with the mind, I don't, I don't know why they picked men for this. This isn't true just for men. This is true for basically anyone. Um, I, I, I believe in this instance, they mean, like, human. You know, oh, in see. that way, that weird text will sometimes, like, right. the, the sins of man. They don't really mean the gender male. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, they mean it as the human race. That's a good clarification. They should just say people, but you know what? Translators sometimes, whatever. Um, yeah, they're weirdos. Right. This is mainly enlightenment. Mainly <laughs> enlightenment. We only got the most masculine enlightenment around here in the saying, gay. <laughs> I don't know why it went so far south. Because <laughs> when I think of like super over like testosterone like men, I, I think of Texas and Oklahoma. <laughs> I feel like a big New York dude could also pull it off. Oh, yeah. 
That's not New York. That's the Minnesota. Des. That was just Des. <laughs> That's just how Des talks. <laughs> um. Okay, so the the thing that happens upon realization with this with this analogy is that up until that point, you're afraid because you're falling, and then you keep falling, and you keep falling. And you recognize, well, I mean, yeah, I'm falling, but there's no ground. So that's okay, I guess. It's the it's the the landing part that kills you, not the fall. Mm-hmm. So now there you are, just falling with some rocks next to you. You might want to push them away in case they bump into you or whatever. You don't necessarily <laughs> need them anymore. <laughs> You're not standing on that. So it's I'm not, not standing on that. I might as well push myself away from this cliff while I fall. <laughs> what, a, what a fascinating analogy this is becoming. Um, in this groundless state, you don't, you don't need to find anything to stabilize yourself because you already know you're unstable. Well, you're stable in your instability. You don't have to be secure to be secure. And that's this is where language breaks down. Um, because the, the, the ego would prefer very much that you grab onto a wall and stop your falling or somehow land on something without dying and can feel safe. Ego is very big on feeling safe. And by safe, I mean certain. But it is wrong to conceive of an environment separate from the pure, unvarying nature of all things. How dare you envision those rocks below? <laughs> Sorry. Right. <laughs> I'm just this analogy is getting wild in my brain. This this is uh this is absolutely true though. I mean, wrong is a bit of a strong word, but you could say mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um an environment separate from the pure, unvarying nature of all things. This is interdependent arising. Um, I forget. I forget the Sanskrit name for it. It's a great word. Um, I'm sure there's a great word for it. I'm gonna believe you. Is it? No, it's not that one. <laughs> I'll I'll believe you that it's not the one you didn't say. Um. What was I saying? Oh, interdependent arising. Uh, yeah, so part of the thing that ego does is it separates. That's, how, that's what labels are. That's what all of this duality is. It's saying it's this, not that. Clearly, this chair mm -hmm. is not a dog. Okay, fine. I mean, I get what you're saying. But what if it was? What and that's, if it was? What if it was a dog, just not in the conventional way of a chair also being a dog? Because mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. would be weird. I don't want to sit on something that's barking. That's weird. <laughs> Pee Wee Herman did it. You can do it too, Max. Uh, I'm all right. Um, so it's it's so it's like a painting. Okay, you've got all of these different images, these different uh, this this entire beautiful scene, and. You know, you've got a river over here, a bird flying through the air up there, maybe some people having a picnic or something. And... Happy little trees. And happy. sure, yeah, happy little trees. <laughs> some happy little trees chilling. <laughs> um, and they all look different. They're mm -hmm. all in different places, different colors, different shapes. But the thing is, they're all brought together. They're all unified. Because they're all drawn on the same canvas. They mm -hmm. can't they can't be separated fully because they're all connected through this undergirding uh, canvas that brings them all together. And for us, I mean, you could think of it as a painting, but you could also just think of it as mm, an interconnected field of electromagnetics and other physics things that, you know, gravity and whatever, acts as the same kind of undergirding substrate for our reality. So, 
I am different. I'm over here versus you, who is over there, just as the bird and the tree are different in the painting, but we are still connected, no matter what we do or say. Mm -hmm. And this understanding is the quote-unquote correct understanding for the pure, unvarying nature of all things. Any, any seeming changes are only changes because we are flowing with time. And as we all know, time is illusion. So if you could look at it We're from, an illusion. A, from a higher order <laughs> perspective. Just toss that in there. Time is an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is 100% the best way to make any talk sound more deep and insightful. Well, it depends on the presentation. Um, so We're going to talk about the it, ethics of ca uh, animal abuse and time is illusion. Let's go. <laughs> right. <laughs> so if you look at it in this meta kind of way, um, you can see that it is all connected even through changing because um, the butterfly is no different from the caterpillar. It's all one organism. The acorn is no different from the tree. It flows into itself. It's just that we draw these lines of distinction between the two because, oh, it looks different or it does something else. But it's all one continuous process. Ab Absolo said everything is made of atoms. And I suddenly was like, I think they mentioned that somewhere. So I started scrolling to like, I think they mentioned atoms. I do a lot of question and answer for the last big chunk of part one. <coughs> this is all, all in caps, so it's got to be important. The fundamental doctrine of the Dharma is that there are no Good Dharmas, Lord. yet that the doctrine of no Dharma is in itself a Dharma. And now that the no Dharma doctrine has been transmitted, how can the doctrine of the Dharma be a Dharma? I'm going to have to read that without you shouting so I can understand it. No, the shouting <laughs> brings clarity. You need it. As does the all capitals. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. That's how you really know it's deep and important. Yeah. <laughs> it's in all freaking capitals. I don't know why the author is screaming at us. <laughs> Maybe he's going to They're trying. Screaming. Why is this book yelling at me? <laughs> <laughs> I came here for a good time, and now I'm feeling attacked. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much of this is a joke. Because if indeed this is along the Zen lines, this could very well be a joke that's also entirely sincere. Mm-hmm. Zen is funny um, that way, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> the fundamental doctrine of the Dharma is that there are no Dharmas. Yet, that this doctrine of no Dharma is in itself a Dharma. And now that the no Dharma doctrine has been transmitted, how can the doctrine of Dharma be a Dharma? Where's Alan Watts when you need him? Oh. Uh, I believe he's... So this... <laughs> oh wait a minute okay <laughs> <laughs> okay that's the summary of our takeaway from the book uh, okay <laughs> it was okay I learned a little I guess <laughs> so this is saying that dharma is not dharma and that's why it's dharma Mm -hmm. um, it's it's speaking of the emptiness of Dharma and I, I suppose in an indirect way it's talking about don't be attached to Dharma because that's not Dharma mm -hmm. um, and by being not attached to Dharma 
You found Dharma. <laughs> Yay! You did it! You did it! Yeah, it took me a few goes-throughs of this sentence to figure out what the hell it's trying to say. The, the no Dharma doctrine has been transmitted. How can the doctrine of Dharma be a Dharma? So it's contrasting the no Dharma doctrine mm -hmm. with, with regular doctrine of Dharma. Um, and essentially having them fight with each other. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's also no difference between them. So this whole thing is a, is a koan. Yep, yeah. that's my explanation for it. There you go. Um, <clears throat> to get something a little, just a little lighter, I do like where it goes over here. If you pursue knowledge for a thousand days, that will avail you less than one day's proper study of the way. If you do not study it, you will be unable to digest even a single drop of water. <laughs> um, I like the intent behind this type of thought because... It's easy to get caught up in the checklists of, mm -hmm. or, I did this today, I did this today, I did this today, I'm on the path, I'm doing it. And then one really free open day where you are and you actively participate in the being that is everything is more meaningful mm -hmm. than, that, than going through that checklist every day for a thousand days. <laughs> right. Um, so I like that a lot. <laughs> it It's very illustrative, too, because it's saying that knowledge won't, knowledge won't help you. Like, it's, once again, you can't outthink this. That's not what it's for. That's not what it is. Yeah. Um, I find it somewhat curious, uh, the translation with, if you do not study it, you will be unable to digest even a single drop of water. In, in terms of study, I wonder, I don't think they mean it in the formal way of sitting down. Yeah, I'm inclined book, to think writing. they mean an active participation study, like a right. on-the-job training, if you will. <laughs> One day, the thing that s saves it for me is proper study, which suggests, you know, doing it the way all of the things are saying, hey, go do this. Mm -hmm. Just do it. Rather... Rather than just be like, I will read this and learn. <laughs> Look how learninating I am. <laughs> yeah. So learninated. How learninated are you today? So. Um, overall, whew, I otherwise. <laughs> personally found a lot of the chapter to have very um, cyclical thought processes it's going through. Interesting. <laughs> um, and it's, I think it's a good read, generally speaking, but I also, um, I'm going to put this in the category of text. I would not hand somebody super fresh. <laughs> oh, no. Like, <laughs> this is not, oh, you're interested in Buddhism and Zen, are you? Let me this slide this book toward you. you no, don't nope. do that. No. <laughs> it's, it's real thick. This is like, <laughs> it's it's thick with three C's. Um, <laughs> which, so... But overall, I, I don't hate it. The introduction and all of that was good. Part one had some a lot of interesting stuff going on. And I haven't read part two yet. <laughs> That's totally fair. Uh, anybody else have any commentary? Sam? I, I don't. Oh. <laughs> I just unmuted. <laughs> uh, dummy thick dharma for, for dummies. <laughs> There you go. That's your new podcast name, Max. Dummy Thick Dharma for Dummies. Oh, wow. shit. 